Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is that we're here in the house of God. We are worship. We're we're the weirdos, you know what I mean, that the world calls. But we're worshiping you tonight. We're praising you tonight. We're lifting up what's in really important, God, and that's the name of Jesus. And our marriages, Lord, that become a witness of your goodness all around the world. God will give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts, our lives. Bless us this night as the Spirit of God just Holy Spirit, touch us, heal us, and strengthen us, and encourage us, and God will give you the praise. Bless all the churches that are meeting in the name of Jesus, proclaiming the name of Jesus, and God will give you the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody say amen. Amen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share quickly with you on the last one. This is number something, I don't know, 16, is it? Wow, man. Number 16 on marriages. And then next week... Um, is it next week we start? We start the parenting. Parenting is how to beat your kids according to scripture. And uh, oh, did I say that? And so if you have people that are raising children, you know, I, I think uh, I, just to kind of whet your appetite a little bit about this. Anybody that has children, raised children, know people that are raised children, how to be coming and listening. Because if you're a grandparent, you say, oh, I've already done all that. It's, not, it's over with. I'm not going to do it anymore. You know, there's always suggestions that can be made. And if you don't know the right suggestions to make, uh, a family can go astray. And so as we look at parenting, there's all kinds of great ideas and insights that we're going to be looking at that will change everybody's heart. I'm going to take you to Ephesians 5, chapter, verse number 21. Verse 21 says, submit one to another in the fear of the Lord. Um, this is our last commandment. This is one that's a commandment to both people, is that submitting one to another. And this is not just rulership of the man. We've talked about that numerous times. It's not rulership of the woman. But in the household, there's a submission one to another. And then it says, in the fear of the Lord, which is really brilliant, because you do what you do. If you don't get anything else out of the 16 times that we've been together, You do what you do in marriage because you're in love with God. And that's what it really says, that God is more important. I didn't say you wouldn't fight. You you will fight. Didn't say you wouldn't argue. You will argue. You will have times of frustration. That's going to happen. Nobody says it isn't. But guess what? You don't breach over it. You don't leave over it. You don't, you know, you love God too much uh, to literally let that continue for too long. And eventually, after you get over all of the hurt and pride and all the garbage that goes on and the frustration of one another, then you're going to have to get back to a place that's saying, I'm going to do what God would have me to do. And you get back in the word of the Lord, which starts in verse 22. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands. Thank God it said own husbands. Debbie really emphasized that. You're not to every man to be submitted to, but your own husband as to the Lord. In other words, if you don't see him and respect him as someone important in your house, sometimes that's hard to do, ladies, because they don't act like the Lord. The Lord wouldn't act that way. But yet at the same time, he's not asking you to respect them and submit to them. Uh, as unto the Lord, because they act like the Lord, they didn't say a word about that. He said, submit yourself uh, one to another, but then the wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as to the Lord. In other words, uh, there's a respect level that's got to stay there. And it goes on in verse number uh, 23, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. In other words, he describes the importance of the husband. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. I don't want to go into all of what we've already spent a lot of time there. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And then he comes along and he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That's an amazing testimony. In other words, that you would love your wife as Christ loved the church. Remember how I said that? I just want to remind you of that. Is how did Christ love the church? Well, he gave himself for the church. 
When the church was yelling, crucify him, crucify him. You know those people that were on the streets as he marched to the hill of Golgotha pulling that cross were the same ones that later on, most likely, a lot of them got saved. And so here we find that there, he gave himself for people who didn't like him. Gave himself for people who were in sin. Gave himself for the future church that's going to come along. All of us that were disrespectful. All of us that didn't care. And he loved the, us so much he gave himself. And that's how he's, he's telling us that we're, we're to be there. Verse number 26 says that you might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. That he might present him to himself a glorious church not having spot nor wrinkle or any such thing. But should be holy and without blemish. In other words, there's a goal involved. The goal is that their family is going to be just like the relationship with God. Now, if the devil can attack your marriage, he's attacking your marriage because he doesn't want your marriage to be a witness for Jesus. You know, when your marriage is good, everybody's going to ask you, what in the world did you do to get your marriage good? You must have a good husband. You must have a good wife. That's not the issue. The issue is whether you do what God has you to do, then you'll have a great marriage. And it will become a witness. So that's why marriages are such an attack right now. Because they're a witness of the goodness and the glory of God. And he goes on and says in verse number 20. As so husbands so ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. And he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever yet hated his own flesh. But nourished and cherished it. Man I love those verses when he got in there. Just as the Lord did the, does the church. And in verse number 30 says this, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. Verse 31, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife. Genesis says this. You're going to see in a moment uh, in the second chapter of Genesis says it. Uh, Matthew, the 19th chapter, says this is not new. That a husband is to leave his father and mother be joined Listen to the word, joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, verse 32 says, which is pretty cool. In other words, you're involved in a mystery that the world can't figure out. But if you figure this out, you're going to have a great marriage, great witness, great things are going to happen in the future. And he comes along and he says these words. He says, uh, it's a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Really not talking about the marriage really talking about the relationship of Jesus Christ and the marriage ought to look like the relationship of Jesus Christ if the marriage looks like the relationship with Jesus Christ oh my goodness aren't we in trouble in the church 50% of the people that are, get in the church uh, uh, that are in America end up in divorce and that's a shocking statement and so here here it is stop think about this it should not be that way at all it's a horrible horrible uh, indictment uh, towards the things of God. And it's not because people uh, want that. It's because people are stupid and don't understand what the word of God has to say. And they just do what they think instead of what God says. If we do what God says, we prosper. If we do what we think, we fail. It's been that way since the garden. And he goes on, last verse, verse 33. Nevertheless, I love nevertheless is in the Bible. Let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let his wife see that she respects her husband. All of a sudden, here comes this word respect, which really in the old King James makes the word reverence come out. And we're, let her see him as a holy man. In other words, and respect him as a holy man. Well, what if he's not a holy man? Then you go to 1 Peter 3rd chapter. 1 Peter 3rd chapter tells the wife what to do. In 1 Peter 3rd chapter, it says you do, do your part Instead of uh, doing everybody else's part, you'll see him come around. In other words, we need to do what God would have us to do, not worry about the other partner. The other partner, here's what usually happens. You're a crab, so I'll be a crab. You're mean, so I'll mean. You're bad to me, so I'll be bad to you. Uh, you're ugly towards me, I'll uh, be ugly towards you. And that's the way marriages most of the time look and act and come along. It should not be that way because we so love God that we get back to where God would have us to be. We love God that we're going to do what God wants us to do no matter what the other partner does or does not do. Let me say it again. If we really love God, we will do what God wants us to do and not what the other partner does or doesn't do. And it's not based on them. It's based on our love for God and what God tells us to do. Tonight, I want to take you, if I may, to the last 
if you will, commandment to the husband. It's kind of a fun one, short one. And it's an interesting word. And I should have, I forgot to write it up on the overhead. It's to cleave to your wife. Now, in order to understand the word cleave, it's a really cool little old English word that they use here. Um, but it's, it's really written, if you will, in verse number 31. It says, for this reason, a man shall leave his wife and his mother, and leave his father and mother, sorry, and be joined. See the word joined up there? The word joined up there in the New King James means they're together, they're one. And it's a great translation. The Old King James has a different translation, which is really fascinating. Remember, this is a quote out of Genesis. This is a quote uh, out of the Word of God in the Old Testament. But let me take you to the Old King James, if I can. Matthew, the 19th chapter, verse number 5. In Matthew, the 19th chapter, verse number 5, it says, it says For his cause, man shall leave his father and mother, and shall cleave. And that's, that's here's this, this principle. There's eight principles for the uh, man of God, or eight commandments for the husband. And the last one is to cleave to his wife, that the two shall be one flesh. The word cleave opens up all kinds of ideas and thoughts and it makes it much greater in uh, understanding and evaluation than just the word join, even though the word join does make that statement. So I want to take you, if I may, into Matthew, and let's discuss it just for a moment. If you've got your Bible, Matthew, the 19th chapter, and you really need to kind of, uh, if you will, get to 19th chapter, verse number 5, and you really ought to circle that word in the Bible, the word cleave, because it's making a statement. Here's what cleave means. It means to adhere. As if you were glued together. Now I'm not talking about sex. We've already talked about sex. But it doesn't, it is, it is also incorporating the sexual relationship. But it's more than just the sexual relationship. It means that there needs to be a gluing together on adhering to each other. And the one who, who promotes that is the man uh, that adheres and glues together uh, with the wife. It's actually the commandment to the husband. To be near her and not far from her and to touch her. You have to be close enough to actually physically touch her. And that's what cleaving is all about. Uh, it is scientifically proved that people who are married and I'm not talking about science, but they like the human touch. And that's what cleaving is all about. It's holding hands when you can hold hands. You know, guys don't do that as much as girls, but guys are the ones that have the commandment to, to, to cleave. That means that you touch. That means you put your arm around her. That means you hold hands, even though it may look silly or you may feel silly, especially as you get older, to hold hands and walk along like you're a teenager, but girls like that, and that's exactly what he's talking about, is getting into a position, getting near, getting close to the wife enough to hold her hand. It's a principle in the Word of God. I want to take you to Jeremiah just for a moment in the 13th chapter of Jeremiah. A principle in the Word of God, and God uses this word. It's an interesting word to use. In verse number 11, He's talking about, if you will, Israel, and he says, for as the sash. Now, the, the word sash, there's an interesting word. It really means as the girdle, and translated in some translations as the girdle. The, um, uh, in the days of, uh, of a battle, they would wear a girdle around their waist, which was a sash that talked about what tribe they were from, talked about who they were, things such as that. So it was a, like a girdle that was wrapped and tight around them. And he says, as the sash clings, and there's that word clings once again, to the, to the waist of a man, so I have caused the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah to, in other words, God says, I'm going to cause you to cling to me. And guys, can I just say something as we, the other translation on that word cling in the old King James is word cleave. And so that we would cleave to God. Here he uses the word cling, but the word there, it's the same word, Hebrew, that is an interesting word, that is really the word, if you will, 
it's clean. And so he comes along, he says to Israel, I'm going to, like a man that wears a girdle. Now, we don't have girdles, and we only know that women wear girdles, but in those days it was called the girdle, and it was like a sash they wore around their midsection, and it was very tight. There they put their armor on with that. They held everything in place with that as they marched, as they walked, as they hiked, whatever they did, uh, all of uh, their uh, you know, weapons and everything were tied to that girdle. And so he says, as a man wears that around his waist, he says, I have caused the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Jesus, uh, Judah to, if you will, cleave to me, says the Lord. In other words, God is in the cleaving business, isn't he? He wants us. Remember, he says these words. He says, if you'll draw near to me, I will draw, what, how's it go? Near to you. The first step is us to draw near to him. So God is interested in us if you will cleaving to him and now if we're going to cleave to him he wants the husband to cleave with the wife you can't cleave with the wife if you're gone you can't cleave with the wife if you enjoy now hear me i'm not trying to pick on anybody if you enjoy being with the boys more than you enjoy being with your wife you cannot listen to this cleave to your wife if you're going to become some kind of crazy sports or workaholics well you never spend time in order to get close to your wife, you're going to have to spend time with your wife. And so God wants us, you know, you'll never get close to God if you, and he causes us to do this, unless you're going to spend time with God. I've never known anybody my whole life that ever got close to God without spending time with God. Time with God in church, time with God alone, time with God in solitude, getting together. It's in those times, I was telling my Bible college class the other night, it's in the times of solitude that God speaks to us and we learn how to hear from the voice of the Lord. What do we have to do? We have to get alone with God. We have to get what? Cleave to God, get close to God. And sometimes guys will substitute their relationship with their wife with something else, either work or their hobby or their car or their whatever it is that they do, even their buddies instead of their wife, and they wonder why their marriage goes down the tube. Let me tell you something. If you continue to do that, you will never be a good cleaver. And so in order to cleave, you gotta be around her, you gotta hold her hand, and you got to you know, hug her as much as possible. This is where I get the privilege of demonstrating what it's like. So Deborah, you get to, I remember I've taught this, I don't know where Luke got it 10 or 15 times, but I taught it four or five times myself. And this is the time, come here, mama. Cleaving is Stay. this. That's cleaving. I, I, wait a minute, now watch, watch. Hold on, mama. Just stand right there. Okay, turn your back on me. I am not cleaving. I, I can't cleave. I have to be there to cleave. I have to spend time with her to cleave. And if I don't spend time with her, she gets bored and sits down on me. <laughs> so, come on, stand back up. I'm not finished with you yet. And so, I have to get out of what I think I ought to be and do and get over to spend time with her in order to cleave. That's what cleaving's all about. Cleaving is not just <laughs> hugging. Cleaving can be holding hands. We like to hold hands. We hold hands, okay? Yeah, I do. Do we have to talk about it right now? And uh, uh, so uh, cleaving is holding hands, you know. Cleaving is when she's washing the dishes and I grab her. <laughs> that's cleaving. Now some of you say, oh, that's really gross. And my kids go, oh, that's disgusting. Well, it's not disgusting to me. Does any man give me an amen in here? Amen. You know what I'm talking about, right, dudes? And, you know, and that's called cleaving. It's called touching, getting close enough to touch. And the problem is a lot of people don't get close enough to touch. And that's the sad part. They find other things to touch. I'm not talking about women or anything like that, but I'm talking about uh, associations, hobbies, habits, business, we, uh, 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 you know, whatever it is that makes us feel good about ourselves. And then our marriage goes down, 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 down. That's why this little thing, give it away, was the whole, for, the whole purpose of that, is so that people get close to each other. Have fun, walk together, 
Danica and, and Lupe are going to hold hands and walk around the great park there. Amazing place to walk. Uh, it's a beautiful hotel. Romans 12th chapter, real quick. A couple more verses. You okay with this? Is everybody all right? And then we'll close and then we'll have communion. And we'll solidify everything with communion. Romans, the 12th chapter. Come on, Jim, where's Romans? What are you talking about? Where's Romans? Been doing this for 40 years. You don't know where Romans is? <laughs> oh, there's Romans. Here's what it says, and I like this. It says in verse number 9 of the 12th chapter, it says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil. And then the word comes along that says cling. Did you know that word comes along? It's an interesting word. It really describes cleaving once again. Cleave to what is good. Very important for all of us. So here comes something. You know, in your life, determine what's good. Sports, guys, come on, let me talk to you just for a moment. It's fun. I think you ought to have that. You ought to be able to enjoy a good game. And I think it'd be fun for the wife to enjoy. Maybe a sport of some kind, it's great. Maybe your car, maybe car shows, but whatever, horses, it doesn't matter. Outdoors, camping, fishing, whatever it is you guys do together. Find something to do together. Deborah and I well, uh, started snow skiing when we were 50 years old. Who starts to snow ski when you're 50? I'm going, Mama, you hate being cold. She says, I know, but what we were doing is something we liked doing. Then I skied for about eight or nine years, loved it, and realized I was going to probably end up in a wheelchair if I continue skiing, and I better find another sport. We start sailing, and we do things together because it's important to find that time. Why? Because you've got to draw near in order to cleave, and God says, draw near to that which is good. Well, he's talking, obviously, about God, but it's the same exact principle in your marriage. What is good? Determine what's good. Is your buddies good? Is getting together with your buddies and having a night out good? Better than leaving your wife alone? See, it, it isn't going to build a marriage. It isn't going to be good for you to do such things. And we see that constantly with a, a, a whole gun bunch. Of, is going out with the boys after work, having a few beers, more important than getting home and loving on your wife? See, that's where guys make the big mistake. Not only is that expensive, not only is that stupid, but it also leads to every crazy thing you can think of. And it won't be long before you're not married and your marriage is ruined and you wonder what went on. And all of a sudden what you did is you, you were over here and you should have been over there. Is anybody listening to what I'm talking about? You were over here and you should have been over there. And stop listening to the peer pressure of guys because guys don't know anything. You're different than guys because you got God. And you're not following guys, you're following God. So cleave to that which is good and your wife is good. Somebody say amen. amen. Acts, go with me to Acts. Just pop up Acts for me just in a second. Acts 11, chapter 23 says like this. It says, when he came into the scene of grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all <clears throat> with the purpose of his heart that they should continue. See the word continue up there? It means that they should cleave, that they should cleave if you will, with the Lord or to the Lord. In other words, if you're going to continue something, cleave to the Lord. If, you're, if God's going to encourage you to get to the Lord, then God's also encouraging you to put place of value on your wife and cleave to her. Hold her hands, get close to her. In order for that to happen, you've got to be around her. And that's why I'm always fighting to be around Deborah. You know, it's like, uh, I'll, I'll go do that with you. I don't want to do that. I really, there's a lot of things she likes to do I don't want to do. Like, I, she says, I'll, I'll, now, she likes to shop, and, and I hate shopping, but I have learned that I'll go shopping, I'll sit down, find a coffee shop, find a bench, man, give me a bench, I don't know what's wrong with these people that own shopping centers, they really want to keep their, the women in the shopping center, they need to have benches for the old men, and uh, I'll get a cup of coffee, and she could shop, she says, no, I don't want that, because you make me too nervous, I know you don't want to be there. And I said, I don't want to be there, but I want to be near you. It still doesn't work. I don't get to go shopping. But nevertheless, I at least tried. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? So the last point for tonight and for this series is to work on cleaving with your wife. If God spoke to you tonight, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. 
I'm going to uh, take you quickly and we're going to have communion together. If you're a husband here and you're a wife here and your husband and wife is here, uh, then what we want you to do is we want you to take communion together. So could I have the ushers just pass out the communion uh, element? De Kim, uh, Kim, Debbie, can you take this? Do you have one of these? And let me give you one. Or oh, here, Danny's giving you one. And here, Dan, I'll put one back. And, um, and let's take communion together. And, and this is where Elijah comes up. Yeah, good. Good for you, Elijah. And if you're single, then just take communion because you love the Lord and draw close to God. And that's what communion is all about, is drawing close to God, really. And God says every time that we get together, we should have communion. That means really drawing close to God, isn't it? So that's really kind of cool. As you draw close to God, it doesn't have to be with the elements of little wafer and, and grape juice, but it can be, of course, and more importantly than anything with your heart. Before you partake in communion, let me just talk to you real quick. You cannot take communion, hear me, if you're not right with God. This is not one of those churches that we have communion and you just get to do it. The Bible says you will curse yourself by bringing guilt and judgment to yourself if you're not right with God and you take communion. It doesn't work. So tonight, whether you're single or married, no matter who you are, before we take communion, let's get right with God. The way to get right with God is to give God all of your heart and to give God all of your life. Hey, that means being born again. That's what born again means. From the beginning of the Bible, the end of the Bible, what's God after? God's after all of your heart and all of your life. What for? That you would live his way instead of your way. What for? Because he loves you so much he wants to prosper you and bless you. What for? because he made you, because he created you, and you're important to him. So nothing but benefit comes by giving God all of your heart and giving God all of your life. It would be better for you not to take communion than to take communion when you're not right with God. Again, when you're not right with God and you're not born again, you are cursing yourself, bringing judgment and guilt on yourself. That's what the scripture says. But here we are in this safe and friendly place tonight. And I will pray with you right here. I won't leave the platform. And you can get right with God by praying a prayer that I'll lead you in right in your seat. How easy is that? How cool is that? Right in your seat, I'll lead you in a prayer from the platform. We'll all pray it together, and you can invite Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and your Savior. And then you can, listen to this, draw near to him in communion. How cool is that? And not be guilty, not have the judgment of his death on you. Wow. And so here we are in a safe, friendly place. And I want to pray with you. And I'm telling you, if you're not right with God, to pass or at least get right with God. And in order for that to happen, Jesus says quickly, he says these words. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get to heaven any other way except Jesus' way. I don't care what anybody else says. You cannot get to heaven any other way but by him. Now, here's the deal. Either he's a liar, either he's a cheater, and he just told us a lie and it's a fallacy, or it's truth. How do we know that it's truth? Ah, for thousands, not a few years, and thousands and thousands of years, with thousands of prophecies in Scripture talking about him, Every single thing he talked about has come to pass. It is not a suggestion. 
It's the truth. Now, along with the truth, always comes somebody that is counterfeit. In other words, I don't know if you've ever known this or not, you cannot have a counterfeit something unless there is a truth of something. For an example, I cannot make a $3 bill and try to pass it to you. You wouldn't, you wouldn't take it. Why? Because you know there's no such thing as a $3 bill. I could make a counterfeit $5 bill because you know there's a real $5 bill. And so how do we know that this is true? It's proved itself over and over again. He's the only one that is resurrected from the dead. The tomb is empty. Walked him up. There is more proof of his, listen to this, listen to this. There's more proof of his resurrection and his life after death than there is that Julius Caesar was on this planet and was a great leader. Did you know that? Did you know there's more written proof of Jesus walking among his people after death than there is that Julius Caesar, I mean, there is no ifs, ends, or buts about it. It's truth. And the only thing you can do is you can invite him into your heart and invite him into your life. If you don't do that, then pass on this. Is that okay? Because we love you enough not to let you do this. We don't want you to do it, and I'm warning you. But I'd love to pray out loud with everybody that is here that needs to get right with God and give God all of your heart, all of your life. That's what Jesus talked about in John 3rd chapter. He said, you must be born again. So if you're out of sync with God or if you've never accepted God or if you accepted God one time, Jesus, and you found yourself backslidden away from him, this is a great time to rededicate your life and give God all of your heart and all of your life. You say, well, Pastor, how do I do it? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. Today is your call. If you confess the Lord, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. So in a moment, I'll count three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. And I'm going to pop my hand on this pulpit. I'll go one, two, three. And I'll go bang when you hear that sound. Bang! Your hand goes up, I'll see it, acknowledge it. Remember, confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. What you're saying by the raising of your hands, pray for me, because I don't want to go to hell, I want to go to heaven. And I want to take communion, I want to draw close to Jesus the right way, and I don't want the guilt and judgment on me. So when your hand goes up, that's what it means. And you can put it right back down. And then we'll all pray together. Man, couldn't get any easier than this. Back in the family room, I'll see your hands, both family rooms pretty full. And I'll see your hands, and tonight is your night all across this auditorium. Just so simple to get right with God in this place tonight. Are you hearing me? Uh, and so who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God I'm speaking to you? Listen, who should raise their hand if you've never given him all of your heart? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you've never given him all of your life? I'm speaking to you. If, if who should raise their hand if you're one of those people that are not sure? Make sure I'm speaking to you. Tonight is your night of salvation. You say, Pastor, I'll be feeling funny if I raise my hand. I'll be embarrassed if people that came with me will see me and I'll feel weird. Yep, you will. Get over it. It's better to feel weird in a safe place than to be in hell for it ever and ever and ever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God says and what he sees. So come on, draw near to God tonight. And give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands on this pulpit area. I want to see your hand go up. I want to count it. And you put it right back down. And then we'll pray together. We'll take communion together. Is that okay? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two. Thank you. There's three. Thank you. There's four. Thank you. There's Five, thank you. There's six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Thank you. There's eleven back over here. God bless you. Anybody else? There's eleven wise people. Eleven wise people are gonna receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior tonight. Anybody else? Anybody else? Eleven wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Eleven, twelve, thirteen. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, praise God. Give the Lord a great big praise for thirteen wise people. Let's pray. And everybody, bow your heads, close your eyes, 
and say this out loud. I'll go slow. You repeat it. Is that okay? Bow your heads and close your eyes. Everybody say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten son. I believe you sent him for me, that he died for me, that he rose from the dead just for me. Thank you, Jesus. I receive you now as my Lord and as my Savior. I repent. That is, I turn from evil and I turn from my sins to you, Jesus, and I thank you that your blood has washed me clean. I receive that now in Jesus' name. Let it be known in heaven. Let it be known on earth that I am saved. I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. I'm born again. I'm alive forevermore. I am a child of God. I am a king's kid. Thank you, Lord. I have the victory. Now give the Lord a great big praise. Amen. And ushers, did we pass these out already? Okay, well, I, I'm really excited about that. So let's peel off that little cellophane part. Now I'm going to read to you from the scripture. And don't just take the little wafer out. We'll, pull up, we'll peel off the little tinfoil in a moment. Here's what the word of God says is Jesus. Uh, and I love the word because verse 24 makes it very clear. He's with his disciples. He breaks the bread. You know he is the bread of life. And he makes this statement. He says, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so I love what Pastor Dan taught us about how to take it between your two fingers and push on it a little bit. And I've never forgot that. And the wafer just snaps because it represents his broken body. Why was it broken? Broken so yours doesn't have to be broken. Broken so the promises of God are yours. If you need healing tonight, why not receive the healing right now as you draw close to God? By his stripes, that broken body, the Bible says you are healed. Wow, how amazing is that? The Lord, here we are standing before you. We are grateful and we thank you for this great time that we can come before you. We just received Jesus and we're excited about Jesus. We're excited about the future. We just know it's going to get better and better because we got God on the inside and we are grateful people. Now, Lord, we thank you that his body was broken for ours so that we do not have to have a broken body. And we give you the praise, give you the glory, and certainly give you all the honor. We honor you, Lord, this night. In Jesus' mighty name, let's go ahead and partake. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? continue to honor the Lord. Verse 25 says, in the same manner he also took the cup, which was a cup filled with wine, and he says these words after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant, my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrances of me. This is a time when we draw close, we remember that his blood was, uh, like Pastor Dan said this morning, on that mercy seat. I mean, that should mean so much more to every one of us today. That his blood was on that mercy seat sprinkled there for you. Wasn't a lamb's blood that last for a year in the high temple or in the tabernacle? It was the blood that last forever. He is the high priest. He's the only one that ever sat 
at the right hand of the Father in the presence of God because the job is done. No one else could sit. The job got done. And his blood signs the new covenant, signs the promises of God, which in the New Testament describe our yea and amen. And the promises of God are mine, not because I earn them, not because you earn them. The promises of God, all of them are mine and yours because he paid the price on that cross at Calvary for us. And the promises of God are sealed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow! Does that put us in a victorious position? Thank God for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As you take and you peel back, if you will, that tin foil. What color is that? Lavender or something like that? Lavender? Is that lavender? Would you call that lavender? Plum, purple, tin foil? I don't know about my eyes aren't so good, so purple is, I think it's too light for me, purple. Let's partake together. So we're so grateful, Father. So thankful for the blood. You know, it's a hard thing to thank you for that you got beat for us so that we don't have to be beaten. Your body was broken open so we don't have to be broken. It's like the lamb's blood, the spotless lamb of God. The blood was taken to the mercy seat, the high courts of heaven, sprinkled there for each and every one of us. Lord, tonight, tonight, Lord, tonight, Lord, tonight, Lord, we honor you with grateful hearts and thanksgiving. And we remember together the good things you've done for thousands of years to get us to this place. We give you the praise, give you the glory. We're so honored, Lord, and we love you so much. Thank you, Lord. Let's partake. Amazing love, how can Amazing love. Amazing love. Come on, stand to your feet. How can it be Let's sing. That you might keep. called by your name they're your body soon to be your bride and God will give you the praise and glory and the honor each one of them will go in a different way this week they're going to work they're going back to the house they're going to take care of kids they're going to be faced with problems and situations things they don't know how to do don't know how to work can't see it, how it would even come to pass. But Lord, I would like you by the Spirit to remind them it's faith that makes this all work. We have great faith, Lord, in you, our King and our Master. We follow you every day. Every day, Lord, we're learning how to cast our cares on you, the one who really cares for us beyond which we could ever imagine you care for us. You've been faithful to us, Lord. We love you and honor you. Tonight, Lord, I would like to pronounce a blessing over these, your people. I stand before you as a pastor, and I ask you to bless these people from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. Blessed in the city and blessed in the field. Blessed coming and blessed going that everything they put their hand to, they shall prosper. And Lord will give you the praise and glory, all the honor. And Father, about our inland empire, 
we say that the Inland Empire shall be saved. All the offering. <laughs> oh my. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.